Hi, good morning and uh, welcome to uh, the 10th edition of our question hour. This is the April edition, the first for the financial new year. And uh, I may also mention that this is a very momentous year for us because this is our Silver Jubilee year, complete 25 years in the business. And also this is the year in which we hope to successfully complete the acquisition of principal mutual fund. Okay. So as is the typical format, uh, let me just quickly take you through uh, latest uh, developments on the economy markets front for about 15 minutes. And then I will receive, already receive a host of questions. We are also happy to take any live questions as they come uh, post my initial presentation. So if I may commence the slide presentation now. Right, a quick look at the world economy. The important thing is the synchronicity of actions. As you can see in the vaccination here, the doses across the world have all been given in substantial number. And the next slide will show you that uh, the liquidity, which is also synchronized, is that Japan, uh, the Bank of Japan, ECB, and the Fed all have jointly uh, pumped in liquidity, very similar to the last financial crisis, but much, much more, right? And the next one uh, slide will show you that this amounts to about $13 trillion in the current year. And over the next two years, double this amount is going to get pumped in. So the story of synchronized action is not just a continuing one, it's going to last till the end of next year, as things stand. So next slide. Uh, we'll see that on the economy front, uh, there has been um, a metals rally, uh, largely driven by a China uh, factor and the soft crude, which has given a boost to the infrastructure development in China and uh, aluminum, copper and uh, steel have seen a sharp growth, right? The next slide, uh, we will see that Oil has been, supply has been fairly coordinated. The synchronous action of OPEC, Russia, as well as America is clearly visible in the stability of the oil supply, keeping the oil prices also stable. Next slide. Right? But this metals rally, uh, the way forward is that we don't think it's going to sustain very much purely based on the China thing, because China has driven metal prices up. But I think the credit cycle in China is nearing its peak, which is the ability of the bankers to lend. I think it's pretty much at 85, 90%. So a further credit fueled uh, boom in China leading to fresh metals rally, we don't expect. What is the key to maintain is whether US comes back to growth path, then you can see the next leg of the metals and commodities rally. The next slide. Right? So what this tells you is in terms of the results, uh, the global new suborder index, right? So that's telling you that all of these are at various highs, some as much as the 200 month highs, so that you can see that the actions are also synchronous in terms of the recovery. Next slide. Right, so overall growth forecast, if you see, uh, 2020, uh, the completed year has obviously seen a negative across the world. India being among the most negative because of our severe lockdown. 2021 is going to see a sharp bounce back to world about 6.7, India about 11 and a half, partly contributed to the base effect and partly the pace of the recovery. 2022 will see a more novel, stable four and a half percent growth and India will be at about six and a half percent. So it indicates a good V-shaped recovery on the annual. Next slide, please. Right. So a little focus on the American economy, because America drives a lot of world thought processes, is that the deficit, because of the liquidity which is being pumped, American deficits have widened, and this has led to a dollar weakening, a very significant thing, which is driving the uh, business, as you will refer to this dollar weakness in a later slide. Next one, please. Right. So we already spoke about this uh, liquidity overall, and the US is going to be the leader because of that 29 trillion, 9 trillion is going to come from the US. Next slide, please. Right, and the, uh, the beauty of this is, is this liquidity with leading to low interest rates, and the fact that there were lockdowns means people have not consumed, means there's a huge savings pile. In addition, the US has given about $2,000 to every tax waiver back in their hands. So we think that in the US, the next leg of the growth is going to be driven by a consumption rally as all these savings gets translates into consumption. Next slide, please. Right, so as a result, compared to the previous financial crisis, within a space of a year, consumption 
is going to come back to the pre-COVID levels as it took three years in the global crisis, global financial crisis. Next, please. Right? So this is translating naturally into a higher demand for goods as opposed to services because people are buying things with the low interest rates. Next slide, please. Right? New business applications, fresh new business being started are also rising. Next slide will also tell you that small businesses are also sharply growing up. So when small businesses grow, it means there's a widespread economic recovery because they get downstream orders from the larger companies. Next slide, please. Right? So as a result, Overall, manufacturing PMI has shown a sharp V-shaped bounce, and it's at about 57, which is almost a decadal high. Next. Right? And the services sector, the hotel room occupancy, as you can see, is showing also a sharp rise, back to 58.9% compared to 64% pre-COVID. Next one. Right? And across the various regional manufacturing surveys, all reinforce the V-shaped recovery on the anvil. Next slide. Right. So overall, to summarize the US, the blue wave, that's the democratic wave, it was a surprise to the market and there's the positivity there. Second is that both houses being under democratic control means reforms can be easily passed. Government is also less interfering compared to a Trump administration with the Fed and no more trade war narratives happening. And stimulus measures like the 1.9 trillion stimulus was easily passed and another $2 trillion of infrastructure stimulus has been announced and we'll expect to go through smoothly. So all of this, we expect that sometime in the near future, there's going to be a strong boost to US growth, which is augurs well for the world economy. The next slide, please. Right. So overall, uh, this just summarizes it. I'll just keep it there. In addition to the US, the key factor that we need to remember is that the Brexit deal has also taken away the uncertainty around the UK versus the Euro fight, which is also now laid to rest. So overall, the advanced economies are set for a decent recovery. Next. Right, liquidity and dollar weakness we already spoke about, oil we spoke about, output gaps in China we spoke about. So next slide, please. Right, shifting focus to India, we are riding the recovery and which is clearly indicated by the sharp recovery, the GST collections of the center plus states, which means economic activity is fairly well rebounding. Next, right, the truck freight rates give you an indication, the Key trunk routes from Delhi to all of the key major cities are all showing a sharp uptick. More freight rates means more demand for freight. So clearly an indicator of economic activity. Next slide, please. Right. So PMI has also shown a V-shape. There is some moderation because of the second wave that's happening. It's come slow down, but it's still holding up above 50. Next slide, please. Right. And the medical success, right, in terms of vaccination, 60 years and above, we have made a good progress in two and a half months. Then that was lower to 45 and above. And by now, most of those also are covered. And starting 1st May, we are going for 18 and above. So I think the vaccination progress is a good one. In fact, uh, we get more as we stop exports of the vaccine and we get support from the US and other countries on other aspects. We think that the vaccination story in about three to six months time, a significant proportion of India's population should get covered, which augurs well for a good recovery and a moderation of the impact of the second COVID wave. Next slide, please. Right? So this is again the same thing, uh, retraded in terms of number of people vaccinated. Next slide, please. Right? And the second wave, that's the risk factor to address. The reason the second wave is a risk, because if you look at the top 10 states, right, they account for half of our nominal GDP. And in this, 70% uh, uh, of our nominal GDP. The key states which are affected by the second wave are Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, Gujarat, and all of them are in the top five. Only Tamil Nadu has shown a lesser rate. So I think the key to track the second wave is an important risk that we have to constantly live with till we are able to get our grip on a good vaccination penetration. Next slide. Right. And so overall, however, from an economy perspective, well, the medical news, the number of people dying, the number of hospital infrastructure, all of this is catching the headlines. We've got to bear in mind, we don't expect the economic impact to be as severe as the first tranche of COVID. Why? Because states will be more reluctant to impose lockdown, having learned from the effect of a lockdown on the economy. Second, we believe that the pent-up demand would help offset economic weakness, right? 
Third is that the vaccination drive we already spoke about. Fourth is that industry itself is now much prepared this time in terms of how to handle a second wave. So I think all those factors will mean that the medical impact may be very severe, but the economic impact will be still moderated compared to the impact of the first lockdown from Corona crisis. Next. Next slide. So RBI has supported the government step by step by pumping in liquidity. As you can see, a sharp jump in the liquidity in the system. The next slide, right? which is accompanied by a drop in the interest rates to all-time low levels. So liquidity plus interest rates. And the next slide tells you that RBI has also helped that without extending the moratorium, which was a concern for the banking sector, they have actually put in place under the Kamath Committee a moratorium uh, uh, restructuring plan, which helps 66% of rated companies, which are with those which are listed also in the stock market. So from that perspective, the NPA crisis, if you look at the next page, right, you will realize the banks also have the big banks in the country have provided increased their provisions because of the stress. So what you do in a provision in a good time when you have good profits, you're setting aside the profit to take care of the bad times when they come. So provision helps to flatten out the EPS of the company. So bad news has already been absorbed early by the banks. Next slide reinforces this, but specifically for COVID, they have taken anywhere between one and a half to two percent as a COVID provision. And only Bandhan, of course, took a larger one because they are in the microfinance business. So again, prudent action by the bank. And the next one is that overall the crisis, the next slide, the crisis, right, hasn't affected the collection efficiency so much. The leading banks are all still in the mid-90s in terms of collecting what the installments do. So overall health of the banking system did not get as badly affected as was initially assumed. Next slide, please. Right, the budget, we have covered it in detail. Just to point out, if I can go to the next slide, these are the numbers. Uh, that the capex was the key focus of the budget, 25% by OY increase. Next slide, please. Right. So the budget, essentially, just the headline is important. The right narratives with fiscal match for support. And the next slide will summarize what the budget was. It is a very pro-growth budget with very little to dislike. I think that's the takeaway from the budget. Pro-capex and not much to dislike. So the markets welcomed it. And that's good news for us. Next slide, please. Right. So as a result is we expect a V-shaped recovery. You take quarter on quarter, this April, May, June quarter should show a very high growth despite the second game because the previous year, April, May, June was a very bad quarter. Next quarter, it should moderate to 14. Overall, we think that initial estimates of about 12% GDP growth, we are moderating that to about double, just about double digit growth for the current year because of the second wave impact. Next slide, please. Right now, apart from the current short term outlooks here, there is the medium term structural positives for India, which are a magnet for FII flows, FDI flows and act as a trigger for a GDP growth of a longer term bounce back. The three key sectors involved are housing, uh, the PLI, which is the production link incentive scheme and the NIP, which is the national infrastructure pipeline. I'll cover each one of these in 30 seconds each. Next slide, please. Housing because of the drop in interest rates, which you saw, you know, housing loans are at less than 7% today because of the softening of property prices and because incomes have remained stable, you are seeing that the affordability of a house is at a lifetime low. Previously in 2003-04 only we saw the level that only need only 27% of your monthly income to buy an affordable house, right? The next slide reiterates the same factor and the next slide after that, tells you that even if you are buying a house to investment and rent out today, only with 3% of additional money from your side, month on month, you can afford to buy such a house. Whereas this was more than double at 7% a few years ago. So it's never been cheaper to buy a house. And the key factor about housing is that it has a mega multiplier effect because cement, steel, copper, aluminum, sanitary wear, paints, building materials, bricks, sand, all of these industries plus housing finance companies and the real estate sector get a boost if there's a housing boom. So I think this augurs well for our country's bounce back to be a broad-based one. The next slide takes you to the other scheme which I spoke about, which is the production link incentive scheme. Uh, with all the problems which China are facing, which will come in a couple of slides, the problems that China is facing means that there's an opportunity for India because of our labor supply and our low cost of uh, wages to grab some of that business. So make Foreigner in manufacturing, easy and competitive India. Government has taken a number of steps. The PLI is the latest of the ones. The other ones I'll just cover. But in this scheme, what we are saying is government is saying we'll give you 5 to 6% of the value addition you bring from raw materials in the country, right? 
we will give you for five years, five to six percent, so that the first few years of the difficult period of setting up a business are completely taken care of. And as a long term, you can look at the India as an attractive business. So next slide tells you which are the sectors are involved, and the estimate is that about 150 billion dollars of new sales and 70 billion dollars in value addition would accrue to the country, which translates to about 1.6 percent of the GDP growth coming from the PLI scheme. So next one uh, shifts focus to the fact that I said that they've made a lot of other steps to make manufacturing attractive. So reduction in the tax rate from 35 to 17 for new manufacturing, which makes it among the best in the world, is a key uh, advantage for India. Next slide tells you that all the investment in infrastructure over these years has led to a 79 ranks improvement in the ease of doing business. Again, a key factor for foreigners to come in. That's a positive for India. The third one focuses on our competitor. The next slide uh, on where China is experiencing a decline in their labor population as see from the red line. India is still in the rising labor population for the next 30 years. So plentiful supply of labor backed by the fact that per capita incomes are one fifth thought of in China, which means China is at $10,000, we are at $2,000. So our wages are naturally also one fifth of the Chinese wages. So cheap labor, plentiful labor is a positive for India structurally. The next slide tells you that apart from this structural dissent for China, COVID has made foreign manufacturers realize that they need to have one leg outside China also. It's called a China plus one strategy. And 44% of the people are saying they intend to relocate at least a part of their production outside of China. Next slide again reiterates the same story. Right. So with that in mind, we'll move on to the third and the last piece of our uh, structural advantage, which is the national infrastructure pipeline. What is this? 111 lakh crores to be spent over five years on infrastructure, basically concentrating on four key segments, energy sector, urban infrastructure, roads and railways. So naturally, you can imagine the multiplier effect in terms of the order books of all those companies which are going to build these plants or these roads or other infrastructure. So again, a huge infrastructure boost supported by the CapEx plan in the rolled out in the budget. Right. So with that, we'll now move to the fact that to support this, the order backlog in the industry on the engineering and construction space is bottoming out. Next slide. So moving to the macro, if you recollect very early in the presentation, I had spoken about the liquidity fueling a dollar weakness, right? So I just wanted to say that the dollar weakness is something that has been driving emerging market performance. So that's a key indicator to track. And if you want to look at it, a weak dollar has always been seen with emerging market outperformance. So we have tracked here the S&P 500, the MSCI Emerging Market Index and the dollar uh, versus the other currencies is called DXY, D versus X and Y, right? You can see the close correlation as the dollar weakens, emerging market performance improves, right? So dollar weakness is a good sign for emerging countries like India from the stock market perspective. Why is this? It's because if you look at it, when the dollar weakening because of liquidity, that liquidity leaks out into emerging market. So we are comparing here dollar weakness with emerging market capital flows, a strong correlation. So first reason that emerging markets do well is they get a bunch of liquidity from the advanced countries. Next slide tells you that when this liquidity comes in and the stock market goes up, right? what happens is that the companies able to take the advantage of lower interest costs. So the earnings tends to go up. So here you're seeing the liquidity with the earnings growth, actual earnings growth actually shows a strong correlation. So the second thing is this liquidity, dollar weakness leading to liquidity leads to a rise in emerging market earnings, which justifies the rise in prices and the valuations. The third one reason for this is that corporate balance sheets, when there's a buoyant, next slide please, when there is a buoyancy in the capital markets, more companies tend to tap the capital markets, raise capital and pay down their debt. So this also brings down the absolute interest cost in rupees and also makes those companies much healthier. And so the risk element in the equity risk premium also comes down. So you get a better bang for your buck in terms of your investment. So that's what is clearly shown, the difference between the NSE 500 companies' net worth what is their reduction in debt and what is the improvement in their debt equity ratio? You can see that debt equity ratio has improved from 0.78 to 0.72 for the market as a whole. So overall, the dollar weakening story supports the emerging market story in a big, big way. Next slide, please. Right. So this earnings 
improvement leads to further stock market rally why because analysts predict a certain earnings it's called the consensus estimate when the actual earnings of companies comes better than consensus only the price goes up to justify because the next quarter the consensus is expected to be higher so this story of the markets constantly beating the estimates drives the stock markets higher and higher so that's the sum of the whole dollar weakness story next slide please now we move to the actual markets in india and what's been happening so as you can see here the nifty earnings growth is expected to show a 22% earnings growth over the next 3 years from 536 in the previous year to 713 this year some marginal correction of the 730 is expected because of the second wave to 850 in the next year so this forward p outlook which you can see in the next slide right is reflected in terms of the valuation. So can you see that the valuations had peaked in December 17 and fell sharply in the COVID crisis, started rising, but they are not yet reached the previous peak in no, most in some of the indices. So the next slide will give you the same data and numbers to you. So December 17, what was the forward P ratio? What is the current? You can see that the large caps are, are about two and a half, slightly more than the previous peak. So the mid caps, the small cap, are still at a discount to the previous peak. So much today. Today, the mid cap index is a 31% discount to the Nifty, and the small cap index is an 8% discount to the Nifty. So clearly, there is space in the broader market for an improvement in valuations. Next slide tells you that when you look at it in the economic activities, right? When the economic activity is very good, which is the first part, the phase one, as we call it, when 2003 to 8 India was in a boom, right? You saw that the small caps outperform the mid caps, mid caps outperform the large caps. Now in the in a, in a downturn, the reverse is true. The latest upturn you can see that all the three indices have participated more or less equally, which means that as this economic rally sustains, right, you will see that the small and mid caps will start outperforming the large caps, both in terms of earnings growth, earnings growth expectations, valuations, and hence stock market returns, right? So next slide. Now, with all the good news that I've told you about the overall thing, there is still going to be volatility in the market because there are some risk factors that we have to keep in mind. The biggest risk is, of course, unabated COVID infection if they continue. If you don't bring the second wave under control in India or in abroad. Right? Now, if you come abroad, what are the weaknesses? We talk about dollar weakness, weakness all the time. But what if the dollar strengthens? Right? That's the risk. Right? And then... The other risk is that the sustained rally in commodity prices. If the U.S. economy comes to recovery faster, if the trillion dollar, two trillion dollar infrastructure program is fast tracked and put on board, you will expect commodity demand. So commodity prices could lead to inflation. So a combination of the dollar strength and the commodity inflation could lead to American inflation, uh, leading to Fed actually trying to do the tapering, which is called paring back the bond purchases, and that could have a negative impact on our markets. In the domestic scenario, a dollar strength would also lead to a rupee depreciation. So the rupee weakness, plus we remember we have a monsoon every year to predict. So this year's prediction will be out shortly. If that turns out not so good, you can expect commodity and food inflation, imported commodity inflation, if the what's written above happens. Domestically also, food prices would go up if there is a shortage of crop due to poor monsoon, then the inflation could make RBI to shift its accommodative stance and also pare back the liquidity, which will not be welcomed by the markets. So these risk factors have to be constantly tracked when we look at an outlook. So while there's a positive undertone to the economic outlook, you remember that the markets are always a function of the news flows around these kind of uh, uh, events that I have pointed out on this page. Never forget that. The next slide tells you to the summary of what I have spoken. So I'll just leave the slide on for just what, 10 seconds for you to see this. So as you can see, two good monsoons has made rural India be the primary driver of our consumption story. The next slide talks about the CapEx side of the story, housing, PLI, what all we discussed just now. Leave it on for 10 seconds for you to just have a look. The next slide, please. Right? This tells you about Sundaram's portfolio strategy. So what we are essentially saying is that for us, the investment cycle resurgence and the secular consumption are the key stories. And in that, the domestic story will be played by increasing exposure to quality financials, consumer discretionary, building materials, automobile sector, and industrial sector. These are the ones you're positive. And any global recovery signs which happens, we'll play through the metals, 
through specialty chemicals to ancillaries and IT services. Overall, on the IT space, we are positive because we believe that the cloud migration, digital transformation story is a sustainable story for the next four to five years, right? So finally, to say that stock selection is important and that uh, the mid and small cap, we expect them to participate increasingly in the coming rally. With that, I come to the end of my brief uh, presentations. And now we'll take the questions which have already come as well as anything that you post on the uh, channel, right? So Shweta, you may uh, start with the questions. You can stop the sharing. Yes, sir. Um, so the first question is, any update on Mr. Krishna Kumar's replacement? Uh, we are in the engaged, we have engaged a search agency. We are in the uh, process of identifying and interviewing. So we expect to you know, conclude the process very shortly. We are very heartened by the uh, people who have actually uh, applied for the role, quite heartening to see a good broad-based interest. And we hope to have a result shortly. But the interviews have not yet started. They will be starting. Uh, sorry. The next question, sir. Um, tax saver fund is very bad. When will it improve? I think the tax saver fund uh, is essentially a multi-cap fund. Earlier, it suffered because it was a heavy, heavily small and mid-cap oriented multi-cap fund. In the time when the mid and small caps were falling, it got hurt very badly, deeply. And some of those mid-cap stocks, when we sell it, we are permanently recognizing the loss. The shift down to large cap is now a large cap oriented multi-cap portfolio. Uh, and I think the performance has started improving. Well, we have started the dividend cycle back again. But uh, I think if you give it another six to nine months for the story to play out, the new positioning of the portfolio will definitely come and help it. So just the six to nine months more is what we expect to get the fund back on track. The next question, sir. Hmm. Why doesn't Sundaram launch ETFs? There is a good demand now. Uh, yes, there is a good demand for ETFs. But, uh, you know, we have just had a CIO uh, leaving and we are in the process of hiring a new CIO. So we will relook at the whole concept of uh, passives and index funds. Let the new CIO come in and take charge of the situation. And he will naturally lay out the investment and a product strategy for the company for the years to come. So I think kindly request your patience in terms of framing this plan with the new CIO in town. It's only fair that when he takes over, he has the right to make those decisions and take the company forward. The next question, sir. I have been watching all your shows, sir. Very informative. Uh, will 2021 be like 2020 for the market? Uh, highly unlikely. Because 2020 saw a very sharp correction in March and a very sharp bounce back uh, post that. I think that the 2021 story uh, will be a story of continuous volatility in the markets. And I think a, probably a high single digit, low double digit kind of a return is what the year will turn it out. Unlike a very roller coaster ride, which you saw in 2020 calendar year. So I think 2021 will be very different from 2020. The next question, sir. Why are you so bullish on infrastructure still? So I think that uh, in the presentation you referred, I saw you uh, is referred to the housing, the PLI and the NIP pipeline stories, uh, plus the China plus one strategy for India, plus the fact that the budget was very pro CapEx. So I think there are enough, the only way to trigger the economic growth, if you look at the China story, how China triggered it, the only way to trigger it is infrastructure because there is something called Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes, who is the father of uh, economics, right, had said that when in crisis in trouble, you have to spend your way out of trouble, not print your way out of trouble. When you're printing your way, you're doing liquidity, you're doing interest rates, you're trying to boost the demand side of the story. But that, when you remove the stimulus, the demand falls away. But according to Keynes, when you do the spending side of the story, that is the supply side of the story, you create infrastructure, you create jobs, those people get salaries, then they go and buy things, and then it creates demand for a whole host of sub-industries, much more longer lasting. So I think that the government has chosen that model now and not 
gone too much down the liquidity ways with the american and the european economies are doing the liquidity basis but now mr biden is changing the story to an infrastructure stimulus even in america so they are also now adopting the keynesian model india is clearly could out of that because we have surplus labor so i think there is no choice why am i so bullish on infrastructure because there is no choice to create the amount of jobs needed because of the youth of our country a government doesn't have a choice but to use infrastructure to generate those jobs so it's not as if the government is pro infrastructure the previous government was anti infrastructure today there is no choice that we have to get our country's act in order failing which with those hundreds of thousands of jobless roaming the streets we will have a civil war situation so if the government doesn't succeed in infrastructure program india is going to be an unlivable country with a kind of strife we will face so you are in a hobson's choice as they call it there's no choice but to go down the infrastructure route yes it will have its bumps it will have its stop and start it will have the second wave coming and affecting so you got to be be patient over the short term for the government to get but one thing you cannot doubt is this, this government is very clear on the path of reform and the path of economic growth so i think that route is only through infrastructure infrastructure is the road to the indian economy's dream of having sustainable double digit growth there's no other choice in the matter so i would say to me safely putting my bets on infrastructure with a five year perspective is a no brainer i hope i've explained my thought process to you um the next question sir this is from usha badri monsoon mm-hmm. is already predicted to be normal any comments i think this is very early stage the monsoon predictions in india uh, constantly keep varying as the data comes in it's good news the markets will welcome an initial forecast of good monsoon but i would suggest we just wait and watch both skymet and india met forecast will come in i think just be a little bit patient but a good monsoon will make the markets run up because uh, it's what happens is that the farmers feel happy when they are sowing well they also spend because you know there is some money going to come at the time of harvest but if the monsoon is bad he says oh it's going to be a difficult time let me tighten my belt one second a good monsoon means some a plentiful supply of food so fear of food inflation which rbi always goes by an inflation forecast so if there is a good monsoon the fear of inflation will come down so maybe rbi will continue its accommodative stance which also the stock market should welcome so good monsoon outlook is very positive for the markets so uh, next one sir us markets are very volatile now which global market to invest in from a three year perspective so i would say that uh, the us market uh, if you choose the company is right see the us market is volatile because of the fact that the us economy itself is uncertain about its growth but if you pick the right kind of companies in the us which though they are listed in the us markets are not so dependent on the us economy so you pick say big branded companies like right? apple mcdonalds right pepsi coca cola uh, ibm microsoft right if you pick big companies like this these get less than a third of their income from the us home country balance 65 to 70% comes from all the economies of the world so their economic their eps growth is not a function of us economic growth so in the us stock market i would say stick to the top companies right uh, and there are multiple funds which do that filter of selection like our global brand fund and and funds like that so i think that then you are actually de-risking yourself from the us economy stock markets that's i would say a better strategy So next question so from Mr Chandra Shekhar how much correction is expected in the market So it all depends on how the second wave covid gets controlled what is the story behind the vaccination the next few weeks second story is that if the good news of the US economy is actually bad news for the markets because liquidity will tend to reverse and flow back so if both these criteria come through there is a US economic recovery at the same time india vaccine story then you will see a sharp fii outflow and i would not rule out a uh, 10 to 15 15% correction in the stock market uh, because it is supported by fii and they pull out there will be a sentimental pull out by a lot of other people so i think that if the bad risk plays out uh, you could expect a 15% as much as a 15% correction the next question from pages belubi sir mm-hmm. what are your views on the microcap segment so i think the microcap segment uh, 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 is basically 
uh, at the very high risk, high reward end of the segment. And I would say for the next year or so, again, they will be volatile because the second wave has come. I was just talking about pro-infrastructure. The micro segment is heavily infrastructure dominated in terms of the types of companies. So if you have a clear five-year outlook, the micro cap space is a good one. But over the next year, year and a half, I expect the volatility to continue because till we grapple with all of these problems, right? The infrastructure push will take time and it will happen in bits and pieces. So I would say that to take a strong view at the very smaller end of the small cap, which is what is micro cap, I would say you go to lengthen your time horizon. The next one, sir, from Lucky Kant Mishra. What's your view on pharma and chemicals? So uh, on chemicals, I think the story is a good developing one because of two reasons. One, it's a very heavily export-oriented one. Second is, it's also the place where you can take advantage of China. China used to dominate the chemicals field, but now China has become very environmentally sensitive. They're trying to prove themselves to the world. Here. So a lot of businesses from China are moving out because of the excessively regulated rules around the chemicals and the byproducts. I think India is in a position in the PLI scheme and all to take advantage. And that's a good export-oriented business. I think India has a good technical skilled manpower in the chemical engineering and other fields. So I think it's a good, good call to bet on. On pharma, I would say that it's a, it's a, it's a kind of defensive part of your portfolio. I think the strong rally in pharma is over. There could be short bursts in rally. Every time there is bad news on the front of the COVID, you will see some pharma stocks rallying. But longer term, uh, I would say that we are not a company that is overweight on pharma overall. Last one year was an exception because of the COVID crisis, but not otherwise on a longer term basis. But that being said, it's always uh, something which should be there in a small portion in the portfolio. So then whenever ignore pharma totally, but don't go overweight on pharma is my recommendation on pharma. The next question from Ganesh, sir. Is the gold rally over? So I think that the gold rally uh, as a rally is over because I think it was driven by US dollar weakness. And we see that the, while the dollar weakness can continue for a bit more time, uh, it's a matter of time before dollar strength comes through because the US economy recovery will mean that. So when that happens, real assets in the US will give you favored over gold, which is only a, 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 what do I call a parking lot. So when you're unsure of the world, when there's high inflation, there's threat of war, trade war, then people put in gold. It's a safe haven, right? The moment you don't need a safe haven, the money shifts out and gold is easily liquidatable. There's no transaction costs, right? So I think that uh, the rally in gold is definitely over. But my answer to an allocation to gold is the same as my answer to pharma, which is that uh, never ignore gold because you don't know what negative surprises are waiting, the third wave of COVID, whatever, but never go overweight. So in the case of gold, I would say somewhere between 5 to 15% of your overall portfolio should be in overall gold, whether it's a physical gold, uh, gold in the form of jewelry, or paper gold in the form of gold ETFs, whatever, 5 to 15% is a range that you should maintain. Another one from Ganesh, sir. What NFOs can we expect this year from Sunga Mutual? So I think that uh, we are probably... Uh, not in a position to do an NFO right now because we have applied for the principal schemes and the mergers. Once we have those space, I'm sure there will be a, a few uh, spaces there. So we will be actively looking at a, at a, a multi-asset fund. That's a possibility. The second is an ESG-oriented uh, fund. Third is an asset allocator uh, fund among because you know Sundram has a, a huge range of infrastructure uh, sorry sectoral funds and a huge range of cap cap funds so I think we are in a brilliantly positioned to run a proper asset allocator model through the FOF strategy so I think that with the new we wait for the new CIO to come we'll wait for the principal acquisition to be approved by SEBI because only then will SEBI entertain a NFO application so probably it's a first half to second half story but I think we do have uh, products which we can bring to the table in the second half of the year. And somebody mentioned a question about ETFs. One of our thought processes is that why not we launch a fund of ETFs that will give you the best of all the worlds there. So a lot of thought processes are there, but probably a second half of the current year story. Uh, another one from Usha Badri, sir. What is your opinion on the stocks in the IT sector? How much more will these stocks go up? So I think the IT sector uh, is a good space to be in because they are very low on borrowings, no debt. 
uh, there is a world which is going through the migration to cloud, internet of things, migration, data, heavy data, with the kind of change in lifestyle, work from home. So I think good quality IT companies have a very three to five year outlook on the earnings. And I think uh, uh, the whole ability of IT to consistently generate revenues is pretty well established. What is the issue? The issue is that market knows it. Everybody knows it. So IT valuations are already reasonably high. So in IT, right, uh, you can have it as up to say 25% of your portfolio, but it will give you stable returns because the earnings growth will be very good, but the market is already expecting it to be very good. So there won't be much scope for positive surprises to give you super alpha. But that being said, uh, you know, a kind of double digit return is eminently possible. And so you should not ignore IT. It should be there as a stable part of your portfolio because a dollar strength risk, right? which is a rupee weakness, is also beneficial to IT companies. So there are a lot of things going for IT today. So I would say that uh, you know, IT sector should be a constant part of your portfolio. As much as 25% can be allocated to IT. Uh, look, Take a look at what the fund managers are already allocating and that any gap is there, you can top it up through your allocation to IT sector funds. Um, another one from Tejas Bellubi, sir. Is it a good idea to have about 30% exposure in portfolio to international funds? Please post your views on how to allocate and which countries to focus on. So 30% is probably touch, uh, touch, touch high. I think the past returns of international uh, markets, especially the US, is what is driving this kind of an optimism. I would park it down to 15% as an ideal allocation. Okay, because remember the Indian economy starts reviving, right? we leave all others far behind. So we are now in a phase where Indian economy is just recovering, but these American stock markets have delivered fantastic. So don't go too much by the past returns and allocate a huge amount. 30% is a bit, bit aggressive, I would say, pull down. Second aspect is the uh, international allocation, right? Choose a fund which has a diversification across stock markets and the underlying companies have diversification across economies. Right. So I would point out our global brand fund here again, uh, because you asked the question is that what is the key of these global brands is that a 50, 60% are listed in the US, rest are listed in other markets like a BMW is listed in Germany, right? Uh, Samsung is listed in Korea. So you have a diversification across markets because of the brands. But the bottom point of the brands is that their business doesn't come from one country. Their business not more than 30% comes from the big country in which they are based, whether it's Germany, uh, Eurozone, or America. The rest of the business is from the rest of the world. So the economic recovery across the world will be captured by these brands and expressed in the stock market where they are listed. So diversification across stock markets, diversification across economies, both can be achieved through the global brand fund. Now, if you don't want to take our global brand fund and look else, look for the kind of thing which are globally diversified funds. That would help for you to capture the next leg of the rally, which is going to be more broad-based and not only a US-based rally. That is the story of the past. The story of the future, I think, is that the rest of the world, both from a stock market perspective, because FII allocation will also start going into commodity-rich markets, which have suffered so far. So I think that to have a diversified, globally diversified portfolio across stock markets, across economies, is the right way to go. But like I said, 15, maybe 20%, if you're very aggressive, of your portfolio can be in international. Thank you, sir. Um, so in the interest of time, should we leave uh, the comments to the other questions on the uh, post? I think so. Yeah. I think we have already, uh, uh, it's been now one hour. I think that's what we max allocated on this time. So I think we'll stop it at this uh, okay, sir. point in time. So thank you, participants. It's been a very enriching, engaging conversation. A lot of wide range of questions. Uh, thank you for the uh, interest you've shown and look forward to meeting you with a series of EMI webinars in English, Hindi and Tamil in the month of May, which will be followed by a questionnaire at the end of May. Thank you and all the very best. Stay safe through the whole corona epidemic. Thank you, sir.